Uh, my name is James Bland. I am a uh, principal solution architect, and I'm also the, um, the global tech lead for DevOps here at AWS, and... Hi, everyone. I'm Curtis Reese. Um, I'm a principal solutions architect focused on um, our partner solutions for AppMod, but in a, in a past life, I got to play a worldwide tech lead for, for DevOps. So a lot of fun getting to see all of you here, and thank you for, for giving us time. Um, I know there's a lot of sessions you could have chosen at this time slot, so we really appreciate you giving us your focus and time, and hopefully if, uh, you'll get something useful out of this. So security challenges that we're hearing from, from a lot of customers that they're having today, right, is one is there's a proliferation of tools that are out there, and a lot of times um, customers don't, need to, don't know what to choose when, right? So, you know, you've got like over a hundred, couple hundred tools that's available for um, security, which is the best practices, which, what are the best ones to use? Um, it, it's kind of hard to tell in the market right now. Um, other problems that we're also hearing from customers is it's hard to integrate like security and compliance and um, regulatory to these uh, DevOps or these um, uh, security lifecycle of software, right? So it's hard to do these integrations. There's not really good integrating points. And so that's just another feedback that we're, getting, that we're hearing from customers. And the last thing that we're also seeing um, in, in terms of security challenges too, right, is that, um, that uh, organizations are just finding it hard to, uh, <laughs> to uh, you know, to react to incidents that they're having within the, um, within the delivery life cycle. So when you have a security incident, how do you react to it, right? So when you're, when you're going, when you're moving into the cloud, what we're, what we're finding is a lot of, a lot of customers are seeing that um, the expansion and the complexity of their work, their environments are growing. And so when you have a security incident, how do you know what to go to? How do you, how, how do you know to react? Where are you, you know, when you get an alarm, um, what services do you look up? How do you use logs? Things like that. Yeah, when you think about the complexities of, of microservice-based workloads, as you continue to move from monoliths to something like that, it's very distributed. And the complexity of that environment continues to grow. And when you're trying to manage the security footprint of that, it can be rather difficult. And so how do you do that effectively? How do you automate that? How do you respond effectively? And knowing what tools can actually help you there is a really important challenge that customers are faced with today. So hopefully you'll get some of that out of this talk. Yep. Um, yeah, we'll, we'll, yeah, absolutely. We'll definitely discuss that in detail. So why do we need a different approach? So if historically, if you look at how we used to do security or how we did do security now at a lot of different organizations, is we look at it from the, uh, the outside in. So we basically spend a lot of time trying to protect the edge. We um, put more locks on the door, um, even though the windows are still open, pun intended. Um, <laughs> But yet, at the same time, it's still we're we're gaining a lot of knowledge, and we're putting you know like IPS, IDSs, and things like that on the edge. But it's really not fixing the core problem, right? We're finding that attackers are becoming very creative, or bad actors, I should say, are becoming very creative, and they're finding different ways to come in. And they're no longer coming in from the edge; they're finding different ways to come in through the windows or the back door or things like that. So no matter how many locks we put on the door, we're never going to actually really solve the problem because that's not where bad actors are coming from anymore. Um, the, other, the other reason we need a different approach is because, I mean, I don't know if like all of you, like some of your different roles, but like as an engineer, um, when I was doing development work, I, I would always find that it was somewhat quite annoying when, we, when I would build a package, build an application, and then, then send it down to QA, and then finally QA would send it to operations team, and then eventually like a year down the road, security would step in, do a scan, send me a thousand different, um, different problems that I have. How do I react to that? I mean, I got a thousand th different things and I'm trying to move forward with my application, trying to develop new features and functionality. I can't react to that. So in a lot of cases, what I usually did was ignore it, right? And, so, and that doesn't really help me and that didn't really help the organization as a whole. So we needed a different approach. So other external drivers that we're seeing that's driving this change is between 2020 and 2021, we saw a 650% increase in the number of supply chain attacks that happened, right? I mean, um, and of that, so 98%, we also saw a 98% increase in the, the number of dependencies that were used that were open source into, into application package. Like previously, we, um, this number was around like 75 to 80% that we would see would be open source packages that would pe people would include in their application. And then eventually, like within the last couple of years, this has actually ballooned up to 98%. So that means that 
only 2% of the, the packages that are act, out there now um, are proprietary, right? Where most of them are 98% are made up of open source software. Um, and the other interesting statistic that we found, right, is that 81% of um, the issues that people are finding with security are with the open source software packages. So, um, so that's why we're, we're, we need to key in on that, um, the supply chain and try to fix the problem at the root instead of trying to fix it at the edge, you know, with like firewalls and trying to block it after the fact. All right, before, I want to level set real quick before what, the, like how we think of it. So the approach that we want everybody to start using is DevSecOps, right? Um, and what is really DevSecOps? And I need to kind of explain what DevOps is. And so DevOps is not necessarily a team that lives in your organization, nor is it a tool set that you can actually use. So ultimately, DevOps is a philosophy. And it came about because what we needed to do was break down the barriers between the dev and the operations team, right? Um, and to do that, it wasn't a tool that helped do that. What helped do that was basically breaking down those communication barriers so then teams would talk to each other, right? So you have the operations team that then is working with the development team while they're, while they're in ideation phase to help them build products that can actually make it to production, run at scale, um, and be, you know, uh, run at scale, be highly resilient. And then you have the de developers team that, that then needed to know how to actually write their applications in a way that then um, the operations team can consume that then was, you know, proficient, that was highly scalable, and um, that didn't cause a lot of problems and a lot of pages that they would have, that they would have to deal with at night. And so DevOps becomes the merging of those two, and it's basically th those two teams working together. And it's an overarching philosophy that, um, of DevOps that, that as, a, as a team, what you're trying to do is you're trying to produce features and functionalities at a faster pace. So then that, that way your organization wins overall, right? And so you combine these two teams, they talk together. Um, why I like the term DevSecOps is because DevSecOps, it's kind of it's sandwiched in the middle. And it's kind of a mashup, right, between um, developer, um, security and operations. And that mashup basically means that we need to think of security holistically. Like security needs to be part of the equation, not at the end, but also at the beginning. Like as you're ideating about your product, thinking about it, doing threat models with the, with the development and the operations team. So the, the security shouldn't be a silo. So that's why I kind of like the, I love the term DevSecOps, but remember, it's not another team that you have in your organization. It's a philosophy that all of these different teams should be working together, breaking down the silos um, to produce you know, better products um, and releasing features and functionalities at a faster pace. Other things that we're seeing, and we all know this, it's, it's somewhat common knowledge, right, is that the, the cost of repair it, um, is greater the further on down the, um, the software delivery life cycle that happens, right? So like if a developer fixes a problem on their desktop, you know, if they're getting the signal and they could fix the problem while it's still on their desktop, it's a lot cheaper than trying to fix that problem after it's been in production for like the last year, right? I mean, that's pretty common knowledge. Um, and so that's also a, a key driver in why we need DevSecOps and we need to start thinking about shifting left um, like the different functionalities that we have when, uh, in terms of scanning and security and things like that. And we also need to shift right as well, right? Because not all the problems can be solved on the developer's desktop or, you know, like in the development lifecycle. Some of these problems need to be also solved um, in the, uh, the operations team or as we think about it, you know, like shifting right. Because we don't know what we don't know at the end of the day. Exactly. So here I'm going to talk a little bit about like some of our developer tools here at AWS. And this is only to give you context. Um, so as I talk about some of these developer tools that we have, um, note that if you're using different tools with your, within your environment, that's OK. Like if, you're using, like if you're not using a code commit and you're using GitHub or a GitLab kind of service, that's fine. What we're talking about today is it can be generalized, and it, and it applies to like whatever tool and lifecycle that, that you happen to be using. So here's kind of like our developer portfolio. We have um, CI CD tools, we have ML tools, we have um, IDE toolkits, um, and a whole array of SDKs. Um, our SDKs are pretty important to us. Um, 
they, they allow you to leverage the AWS services, but also using our best practices. So they have things like um, exponential back off, they also include jitter, they also include retries and things like that that make them, that, that make them very uh, important in terms of the ecosystem of the developer tools that we've created. And you can see from this list here, it's a pretty, um, a pretty broad um, offering that we have, and it's also a pretty deep offering. Yeah, the, the thing that I'd like to add here is, is going back to that conversation of you don't have to use these specific tools. James and I actually work with the, the, the third party in integrators, the ISV solutions, and we help build a lot of these integrations. So if you're using a third party solution in place of something like code commit or code build, we want to make that as seamless as a process as possible. We want to make sure that you can continue leveraging those and see success of running and securing your workloads on top of AWS. So by no means think that you have to be bought into this particular scenario or our specific set of tools. But just understand that these are built to be able to communicate well with each other, simplify the integration story, and many of them mean you don't have to manage certain solutions yourself. So there are some, there's some in, uh, intrinsic value of using some of the AWS services so you don't have to spin up an instance of something, have another EC2 instance that you have to try and manage and maintain secure in addition um, to, to the workloads themselves. Absolutely. Our, oh. Code commit, sorry, code commit. Um, so code commit is basically our Git repository. So you, it's a secure Git-based repositories that live with inside of an AWS account. So developers, this kind of goes in terms of the developer self-enablement where developers can spin this up in an account. And these are private repos, so the, and these, um, uh, integrate with well with all the other different AWS services. So you can wrap around like IAM policies to do different things. Plus they also send out like when you do um, different transactions with inside code commit, like, um, you know, like get, you know, do check-ins or you do merges and things like that. All of those are emitted into events, into um, CloudWatch events or event bridge where you can actually key off of different rules. So you, you can do different things um, based off of code commit. Push the wrong button. <laughs> code build. Now, code build is um, our uh, code, our generalized like code building so, um, tool. Basically, you can use um, your uh, a prepackaged uh, contain or image, or you can use a, a custom built image to actually run your build jobs. So, um, when I say it's a generalized like build tool, because it also does building and testing. So, if you look, on, if you can see on the right hand side, like the buildspec.yaml file, it has an example of. Um, like different build stages that you can run where you can do like, um, uh, like in this particular example, you can do pre-build, build, and then it has a post-build um, section. So it's basically you just run like um, uh, arbitrary uh, Linux commands of what you're trying to do with inside each of those different sections for a code build. In code artifact, um, code artifact is our artifact repository. So think of this as like the, um, um, a uh, pip a Maven or uh, a um, NPM kind of service. So basically it lives with inside your AWS account um, and it, when you request these different dependencies, it goes, if the dependency isn't located on code artifact, it will actually go out into, you know, like NPM or PIP or Maven and it'll actually pull that artifact down and store it locally with inside your code artifact. Some of the advantages of being able to do that is that now you can wrap around policies and you can wrap around different things because now you actually have a local copy of that code artifact, right? So you can pin things, you can actually um, do scans against the, um, the code artifact to make sure that your developers are actually consuming um, secure uh, dependencies into their, uh, um, the, their build jobs. And then we have code deploy. And code deploy is an actual, like a true deployment system. So I see a lot of customers that are using tools like, um, like Terraform or using CloudFormation. While that's good and that's great for infrastructure, it is not a true application deployment tool. Um, so you need a, a true application deployment tool, then that's what code deploy actually is where it, it can handle the different states of your application as it's moving the cycles, but more importantly, it can truly roll back an application and not leave it in a terrible state. So like if you're using a Terraform as an example, the, the problem with using a, a tool like that for deployment of the application is that it doesn't have a context around your, what your application actually does. So when it does rollbacks, it can actually leave your application in a really poor state. And so code deploy actually does a lot of that cleanup for you um, when it's configured, right? So it is a true deployment engine. So it has a context about you know, the status of the, of the application that's actually deploying. 
All right, and then finally we have code pipeline. So code pipeline kind of like stitches all this together. Um, um, it's, it's the orchestration tool that puts together like code commit, code build, code deploy, um, and, and uh, code artifact, in fact. Um, and it's an orchestrator, so basically it has build stages in here. Um, so think of these stages, uh, it's different. they're a little bit different from the, um, the code build that I showed you earlier. So code build, those were stages within inside the actual build job. This is, where, this is one where you can actually have different stages where you have like checkout, and then you can actually have like a, an actual like build stage and a testing stage in separate, and actually have multiple of those uh, code build environments going on, and even simultaneously, right? So it'll run in parallel as well. And then finally, this is how things are kind of like stitched together. So like when we look at like the source, build, test, deploy, and monitor stages, we, um, for CI, CD, this is kind of how they, they kind of fit. Like so you have code commit on the far left-hand side, then you do code build for your build. Testing, you also use code build, because like I, like I mentioned earlier, it's more of your, your general purpose, like build environments where you can run arbitrary like Linux commands. And then you have your deployment engine. And then all of that uses um, code artifact and then then you can monitor this with uh, uh, AWS X-Ray, which is a, uh, um, a uh, tracing type utility uh, for APM, and uh, Amazon CloudWatch. All right, so let's talk about pipeline security. So we think of pipeline security um, here at AWS in two different ways. One is we think of pipeline as security in the pipeline. So this is what most people are commonly familiar with, where um, security in the pipeline is is security as your application is traveling through the pipeline itself, like how you're securing it, how you're doing static code analysis testing, how you're doing different testing within the pipeline itself, right? So going through the source, build, test, deploy, and monitor phases. And then we have another way of thinking of it, it was just security of the pipeline. And security of the pipeline is where you're thinking of your pipeline as an actual application where you're trying, you're, you're make, we wanna make sure that you're actually securing the pipeline itself, making sure that the people that um, can make changes to the pipeline, make changes to the builds, make changes to like testing, things like that, are that, uh, that you're leveraging best practices for security of the pipeline. And this is where you, we want you to think about like the pipeline as a workload in itself. It's an application that needs to be patched. It has its own configuration, things like that. So let's talk about a little bit about security of the pipeline. So here I wanna share with you today uh, the Salsa framework. So the Salsa framework is, it's, a, um, it's not necessarily open source, it is a Creative Commons um, framework that provides best practice guidance on how to secure the actual pipeline itself. So like the different steps that I have outlined here, like A, B, C, D, E, F, um, G, H, are different points of the, um, of the pipeline that you really need to think about. And the Salsa framework provides guidance for each one of those different stages on how, on best practices and guidance on how you should secure that things and the different considerations that you need to take for each of those different steps. So the first thing I wanna talk about is like source integrity. So this goes back to the, the, the Salsa framework. So source integrity, um, uh, is related to those threats that are like uh, around source. So basically, you know, like how do you submit changes without review? Um, how do you um, uh, preventing evasion of uh, code review process? Um, and also code review bypasses. And also, you know, like how do you uh, compromise, like uh, um, how people can compromise source repos? And some of the mitigations, you know, and I'm not including all of them here on this slide, but some of the mitigations that you can do is like re require like two persons to do like a, a peer review before you can um, um, before you can major uh, or merge a change into like a mainline branch. Um, other things is right is like using a role to do your merges instead of actually depending on an actual person. Because I don't know about you, Curtis, but um, like I've been uh, guilty of it myself, where I had like you know like super user access mm -hmm. and. Um, um, I didn't have anybody to do a code review, so I went in there and I just clicked, you know, merge myself. Uh, very poor habit. I, would, I don't recommend doing that for anybody, but uh, I've been guilty of it myself. <laughs> it's, it's important to have those checks and balances because even in a lead developer, like if we find those scenarios where somebody submitted something late on a uh, Thursday or Friday, it's like you just go in and make that change yourself. And the reality is even as a lead developer, there should be some kind of check, check or balance put in place to prevent you from making those kinds of changes that are risky. Yeah, absolutely. Um, 
And so here's a solution that I want to kind of like talk about a little bit of like how you would actually solve like some of like a specific use case for source integrity. And this one solves the, the use case for um, having at least two people uh, or having one person at least do a peer review and not allowing um, a specific person to be able to do the, um, to the merge into a pipeline. So in this particular use case, um, what we do is you, you would set up an IAM policy that don't allow an, actually any individual user to do a merge Within the um, within the code commit, right, and then code commit when it actually when you have a merge request or when you have a pull request, basically it would actually um, uh, send an event to uh, Amazon um, uh, Event Bridge, and then once it sends an event to Amazon Event Bridge, it kicks off a Lambda job that then looks at the um, looks at the repo and sees that um, somebody is actually peer reviewed it and it's not the same person that actually um, that uh, submitted the, the pull request. And then once somebody does that, it actually uses a role to make that merge itself and then deletes the, then deletes the, um, the branch that it's actually merged from. Um, and then once that all happens, basically it sends off an alert using SNS and then you can fan out this alert to Slack, to email, or to whatever alerting system that you, that you have in place to, to notify the developer that, you're, that you've been successfully merged. And this, this, this solution allows you to kind of like decouple the, the, um, uh, the different you know, like areas of responsibility. So now you don't have a single person actually trying, that has to do the merge or you know, like some Uber right that you're, you, that you're uh, applying to, an act, to a developer that, to allow them to do all, all the merges. And then the second, the second thing of um, of the Salsa framework is build integrity. So, like some of the some of the general threats that you see in kind of like build integrity is um, being able to build from like a um, an unofficial uh, fork or a branch, um, build from uh, you know like different build state uh, unofficial build stages, and also you know like. Um, uh, comprise build environments of, you know, like use, using different build environments that, um, that you're not basically supposed to, right? And then also how do you, uh, you know, tamper, uh, artifact tampering with inside a build environment. So build integrity, that, that framework, it, it provides guidance on how to actually uh, mitigate a lot of those different thefts. And some of the mitigations that it actually has is basically you can target a specific branch for builds um, and what I mean by that is that a lot of customers I see what they do is they basically target like, hey, anytime anything is um, like any branch, they just wildcard it and they just build off of that branch. Just uh, while that's great in some respects when you're you know doing development work, you kind of want that feedback. Um, what you want to do is you want to try to limit that. So you have a you use a naming convention, but also that all that um, you want to make sure that you're not. Um, that you're, that you're targeting specific branches so then people can't um, arbitrarily like create branches and then introduce like different, different type of code that is going outside of, the, um, outside of your, uh, your like main development software delivery life cycle. Yeah, and this goes back to that door analogy kind of at the beginning. So as attackers know that you're hardening the door or hardening your production environments or hardening certain aspects of your application, they're finding the alternatives. They're going further left into the stack, further left in the software development lifecycle, finding ways to try and get in early into those processes. And if you don't have those checks and balances in place to identify the opportunities for those, those attackers to, to get code in, if you're not scanning for that, you put yourself at risk of basically using some of these compromised uh, environments. And oftentimes these are, because these are at the developer level or they're earlier in that process, the teams behind them are a little bit more lax with them. Because it's like, oh, it's, it's still in the house, but you're not realizing that the attacker is trying to get into your house. That's where they're, they know you're least secure. You're not locking your bedroom door, you're locking your front door. So they want to try and get a way into your house so they can get in and make those changes as early on as possible. Because if you don't have that in, it's easier for them to get into the code base and start affecting things later on in the process. Yep. And so here's a solution that we put together for the use case of uh, build integrity. So making sure that, um, that you're building off of dependencies that, um, that have been approved by your security, your security departments or your scanning tools and things like that. Um, so here in this particular solution, we start with code pipeline. So code pipeline is the orchestrator that I talked about earlier. Um, it, pull, it uses a code commit, which is a private repository that your organization has. Um, 
uh, it uses code build, and code build reaches in and uses um, code artifact. So code artifact has a very interesting feature in it um, called the, um, the, what is it called? Um, it's called uh, package origin controls. So within package origin controls, it allows you to target and specify like, hey, this is a, a specific source is actually my, um, the, my master source or my, um, uh, the provenance of where this package should actually be that has been tested. And what, this, what the, uh, this package origin controls is very important because what we're seeing is we're seeing attackers actually, um, when they can figure out what naming convention that you're using for internal packages, what they'll do is they'll come up with something like a, a my pack, like let's say you're using my package version one. What they'll do is they'll come up with like a my package version 1.1, and then they'll publish that 1.1 into like a public repository. And so then what ends up happening is your package manager is actually pretty smart, and it knows that it's like, hey, I'm going out to like NPM, or I'm going out to PIP, or I'm going out to one of these other package managers, and it has an updated version. It has 1.1, and I see that in our local environment, we have 1.0. So let me get that updated version, pull it down, and now you're gonna build off of a, um, a uh, compromised source or for that dependency. So what package origin controls allows you to do is it allows you to um, dictate which actually one is the master. So basically you're gonna say, hey, my internal one is actually the, the, the master source or it's actually you know, the origin for that particular package. So even if you recognize that uh, an update has been done for this particular package name, no, I'm still the major source, right? So it, it helps with that particular type of uh, supply chain attack. Um, and so in this solution, it uses the um, AWS code artifact once it uses the AWS Code Artifact, it builds that. We deploy um, ephemeral environments. And for those who you don't know what ephemeral environment is, it means it's just temporary. And it means that we shouldn't, you shouldn't go out into that environment and make changes locally. What you should always be making these changes with is using like infrastructure as code or using your code to actually change these environments. So you'll change these environments in Git. Um, the, so one of the benefits that you get by treating these environments as ephemeral is that now that anything that happens within that environment you know is um, it's a compromise of security. Like so if, let's say if you don't allow like SSH, right? So like if somebody logs in at SSH, now you know that uh, that is actually a violation of security policy so you can kind of quarantine that particular container or that instance that's running in that environment. And so that by treating it like an ephemeral environment, you kind of gain the, these, some of the, these uh, positive side effects, if you will. Um, and so in part of the solution too, we have like AWS config, so it'll notice that anything that has changed within one of those environments, it'll actually spit out a, um, uh, an event. Um, AWS code um, config uh, with, a, with a config rule will detect that event, um, kick off a lambda or kick off an alarm, and then you could send that alarm to SNS to notify, you know, like a Slack message, or you can send it to other services like um, uh, Security Hub or even, you know, uh, email and things like that. <coughs> Pardon me. All right. So availability and other threats. So um, other threats that we see, like in terms of availability, and I kind of mentioned this earlier, um, or actually I didn't mention this earlier. Um, one of the availability threats that I've actually even had personally is that, so when you're going to build a job in, uh, or you're doing a build and you have different dependencies that live with inside your code, um, if that dependency is unavailable from the, um, from, an, from the external source that you're getting it from, then your build job is basically stopped. You can't move for, for, um, further, right? And you don't know when this availability is actually gonna come back up, right? Like I've actually had, um, personally, I've had a, a public repo or a specific package on a public repo go down for three days. And so we couldn't do anything for three days because we were having to wait for that. And so what it made me think about is that, hey, we need to actually store and have our own package resource that we can actually pull from so then we can mitigate that particular, um, you know, that downside that if uh, this public package isn't available, then now we can pull it directly from a local source. Um, other mitigate, so other ways that we can mitigate too is basically, uh, you know, retain version controls and um, uh, the history of it, and I'll, and I'll talk about, uh, about that in a second with um, like some of the solutions that we have in place. And um, this, is, this is really important when you're looking at, at having an artifact repository, something like JFrog or Code Artifact or others. 
instead of pulling things live from the internet, live from um, Docker Hub or wherever, like the idea is you're always pulling from a local source that you know is available at all times. Um, I've had this experience as well um, with, with my previous company where there was a, a random number generator for Node.js and that, that one library was taken offline and it broke so many other things because it wasn't a direct dependency of our application, but it was a dependency downstream in the, the supply chain where one of the libraries we needed needed it for one of its libraries and eventually that actually broke us. And so it, it, it emphasizes that importance of having something local that you're constantly pulling from and then from the security side of it, now that's something that you can actually scan. And we'll talk about that a little bit more in a, in a moment. Yeah. And so here's a solution that we built for like um, source and artifact um, availability. So what we want you to think about is like not only like having this within AWS. So we do have a, a lot of uh, uh, redundancy, like so when you're using a lot of these different services. But also think about copying the services off to a uh, to like an adjacent AWS account. And when I say copying this off, I think about it as like read only, because I've actually had in, in, in my personal experience I've had where somebody was doing some kind of like pruning job. They went through, they pruned a bunch of like a bunch of data, like a, 500 gigabytes of data from a, um, from a repository we had, and our replication worked really well. And it replicated to all the other repositories that we had. And so we lost that data uh, where we had to restore it from backup, but then it, restoring from backups, it took like six months to get because we had to go through a bunch of different tapes and things like that. So think about this, think about like when you're, when you're actually copying this data to a different account, like for code commit, your artifact repository, and also anything that you're storing in like containers, um, think about it like append only. So, we, so then that way you don't have any problems like, um, uh, that come along if somebody does a pruning job and then it also replicates to these other accounts. Because if you're doing a pen only, then you're basically just storing the changes. So you have a, a history of the transactions that's happening. Yeah, and even, even worse, if from a security perspective, say somebody does happen to get into one of these, you don't want that then replicating to other sources. You always want to make sure that there's some kind of separation so that even if something is compromised, you can actually pull from a, yeah. a clean source to replace it once you've identified that. Yeah. So this is an important process to help you along that way. Yeah, yeah, because the, the reality is that bad actors know about <laughs> logs, right? They know how to go clean up logs. They know how to go, go clean up all this different stuff. And so that's why you want to have a kind of like an append only where you have this transaction of th things where people can't tamper with, right? And it, and it lives inside of a different account that, um, that you know, very limited people have access to. All right, I want to talk a little bit about like verifying dependencies. So um, Curtis is going to talk about later about SBOM, so I won't, I won't steal his thunder on that. But what you really need to do is when you're checking your dependencies, you, re you need to require from all your dependencies um, is an SBOM that you can actually check against. And what this is is you're verifying the provenance and you're verifying the signature of this. Um, um, Curtis will talk about what's actually included in, a, in, a, in an SBOM, what you, need to, what you need to validate, but I thought it was an important topic to talk about now, where um, you basically you just need to make sure that you have this in kind of like your build and your testing steps where you are validating these hashes. And I know that like, um, um, just from, even from my past, like I've, I've always been kind of lazy. So sometimes a lot of packages actually come with hashes, and you don't, ah, I don't, I don't need to check it. You actually should check that, right? You should actually verify that the hash that you've actually downloaded matches what the, what the vendor or what the open source project actually has for that hash. And oftentimes these are very simple processes to automate. And so if you're not automating that, it, this is something that you see a lot with OPA or Open Policy Agent in containers, like where you actually look at the hash of the actual container from the, the image repository so that as you're trying to schedule that particular container onto your cluster, you verify that hash. And so you know for a fact that what you're actually deploying is what you actually expect. And so verifying this dependency, and like you said, I'll go through SBOM in a little bit, but the idea is we want to make sure that you're actually taking the steps to validate that what you're deploying is what you expect. And you're not just kind of trusting <laughs> the source and trusting it. Um, because somebody might be nice looking, but they might try and steal your wallet. Like You don't want to base <laughs> it off of just trust alone. All right, and then guardrails. So guardrails is something that we use here at Amazon. Um, and so what it does is it reduces the occurrence of events and it also reduces the blast radius. And guardrails are more of, a, um, and I'll give you a practical example. So like I manage a, um, uh, a production account here at Amazon. And one of the things that, um, 
that we have as a guardrail is the S3 buckets. So, so we're not allowed to create S3 buckets, or I shouldn't say we're not allowed to create S3 buckets. If you create an S3 bucket, a public S3 bucket, you will get flagged because you know a public S3 bucket is, uh, is in some ways bad. But as a developer, if I still want to create a, a, a public S3 bucket, I can. I can do that intentionally. I can go in there. There'll be several warnings for me that says, hey, do you know that you are creating a, a public S3 bucket? I can say, yes, I know. I want to create a public S S3 bucket. And then later, I will get a ticket flagged against me that says, hey, you created a public S3 bucket. Did you, is this what you really wanted to do? Um, and so I have to intentionally choose to create that public S3 bucket. And that's kind of how we want to think of guardrails, right? It's, it's not something that is encumbering developers, but it's something that makes them think about what they're doing and make, and make sure that they're very intentional yep. about what they're trying to do, like with the, the public S3 bucket. Yeah. And so that's why how we like to think of guardrails. Yeah, it's that intentionality that, that, that's the important thing. It's, it, we, we don't want security to be seen as a draconian process that's kind of forced on everybody, but we do want to make sure that it's a conscious process. So in the event, like the, the example there, like you want to make sure that, hey, are you sure this is what, you're, <laughs> what you really want? Because this is the, the risk that you're, you're actually creating. And it's fine, but we need to track those and keep track of them. So when he creates a bucket, I'll get a, a flag. Like I've been on stage before and had my phone start ringing. There's an alarm that basically <laughs> like fires off. So if somebody on my team creates that, I know that they, they've done that. Um, but it's important to, to keep track of those types of things and automate them wherever possible. Yeah. So here's an example of guardrail. So this uses OPA. So OPA um, stands for the um, Open Policy Agent. Um, and OPA is a kind of like a, is a uh, technology and a tool that allows you to define um, uh, policy and it separates the policy versus the implementation or the, um, the control and the enforcement of it. Um, this is an example for like a um, EKS, a constraint.yaml that you can deploy. And basically what it says is that, hey, if um, as a developer or as somebody who's trying to deploy something, I can deploy, if I'm trying to deploy from my private repo, um, a container from my private repo, it allows me to, but if I try to um, try to deploy a container from my public repo, I, it, it denies it or it stops me. Um, as a developer, I know that, um, hey, I don't get, um, um, when, I, when I use this kind of policy, it doesn't actually prevent me from, um, from deploying my container. It just tells me that, hey, you know what, if I really want to deploy this container, I need to move it into my, posit or my private re um, um, container repo. And then from there, I can actually wrap policies around it to scan it to make sure that that repo is, uh, doesn't, uh, or that container doesn't have like, uh, you know, like malicious intent. Mm -hmm. And so some final, some security considerations for security of the pipeline. Um, so like I said before, I want you to think about like security of the pipeline as, a, as the pipeline itself as an application. So you need to think about like how you're storing secrets, um, how you're storing the configuration, making sure that people don't, can't have access to it to ch change that configuration. Because bad actors, if they can get, attack your actual pipeline itself, they can do a lot of damage because then now they control how your builds are done. They can insert different things within your build process. They can actually change the dependencies. So you really need to think of your application, uh, the pipeline itself, as an application. Um, all right, I will give Sorry. it over to Curtis. All right, now that we've talked about um, how do we secure the pipeline itself and secure it as an entity, let's talk about how we actually move things through it and how do we secure things within it. At a high level, there's a lot of different, there, there's multiple stages that exist within your pipeline. And so they, they kind of, you've seen them on screen previously, but just to get a high level, here's the code stage, there's the build stage, there's the test and deploy and the monitor or observability stages. Within each of these stages, there is an opportunity for you to perform a specific set of security tasks that relate to that particular stage. It's like we said earlier, it's like you don't just put security at the end when you're running something in production. Every step along the way for how you get from code on a developer's machine out to that production stage, each of those has an opportunity there. And when we start it from the, and I'm gonna explain each of these in depth in a, in a moment, but when we start at the code level, this is where we can do things against the source code. So as developers are actually writing the code, we have opportunities to run scans against those codes or that code and make sure that they're not 
writing vulnerabilities into the code and then storing that in a source code repository, and now it's part of your version history. Um, I'm, I'm moving on to the next one. Accidentally. Um, but when we move into the build phase, that's something that now that we're building that, that code and we're actually running that code, it lets us start looking at like what are the components of it. So as we're building the artifacts, are we including libraries? Are we including downstream things? Are we including things from, from public open source repositories? Now we have to start considering like how does our security footprint look in the, in, with the fact that we're actually pulling these disparate sources and we're pulling them together into to, to our code base. And so we have to accept how, like, understand how we're looking at the risk for that and what are we doing to mitigate the risk. When we actually take those built artifacts and start to execute them in the test phase, now we have running applications. So this gives us the opportunity to now start running tests against those, against those running applications. So this is where things like pen testing, load testing, things like that come into play, where we're past the code phase of the, the, the pipeline, and now we're into the actual running state. So do we have ports open? Do we have SQL injection? risks. This is the opportunity for you to start looking at that. And then as we start to go through deployments, as we mentioned earlier, this is your opportunity to say, well, we've built an artifact, and when we built it, we did all these security checks, and we attested that those are validated, and it's safe. We created a hash of that artifact. So we know what that artifact is and its signature, essentially. So then when we go to actually deploy that, our deployment system can actually take a look at that and say, okay, we're looking for this hash. Here's the artifact that we've downloaded. Let's run a check on that. Does the hash match? If it doesn't, you stop the pipeline, alert security, alert your operations team, because something happened in there. So these are the opportunities that you have there. And as you go and you actually run this in production, it's not like that's the end. You, yes, you've written your code, you've built your artifact, and you've actually pushed it out, but it doesn't stop there. Like Now that it's running in, in production, this is now your opportunity where people are still gonna try and find their way in, so you need to continuously monitor. And so this is where runtime scanning, things like that can actually come into place. So let's look at these and these opportunities um, in a little bit more depth. So early in that process, when your developers are actually writing their code, this is an opportunity for you to start doing things like scanning for sensitive information. How many of you are developers in this room? Okay, a few of you, good. Good chunk of you, actually. How many have used a local username and password to a local database before? Quite a few of you, yeah. Usually, you're gonna use some kind of local envir environmental variable and you're gonna use that to access it so that that username and password isn't necessarily in your code. You're gonna be referencing it essentially dynamically. And then later on in the pipelines, maybe you're referencing it from some kind of security store or something like that. But every now and then it's, Friday night, you're on a Mountain Dew craze development kick, and you're on a roll, so you just kind of add it in, in the code itself. Well, this is your opportunity that when you go to save that code, your IDE can have a plugin that can actually scan that immediately and alert you. Hey, <laughs> you slipped up, there's, a, there's an actual secret in here, get it out. The same, is, uh, in the, the same can be done with the sense of like Git hooks. So at, at AWS, we have a tool called Code Defender that we use. I don't know if it's something that we built internally, but um, there's um, Spectre Cloud offers one too that basically plugs into Git locally. So when you actually go to create a Git commit, it will trigger a scan and let you know immediately whether there's something sensitive in there. It'll tell you the line uh, that, that the code is at, and you can actually fix that before it gets into your history in your Git repository. And then is something that has to go through a cleansing process and all kinds of other stuff. And so the fun thing about that is it starts to notify people. So how many repositories do you have? How many risks have been, are you trending up? Are you trending down based on these risks? And, these are things that don't have to be done by the developer, they're just kind of there to help support the developer. So it's not additional steps and chunks for them, but it's something that can actually be, uh, be very helpful. And then you can do that on the repositories themselves. So at regular intervals, you can be scanning those repositories and making sure that something maybe didn't slip through in a pull request or something. Maybe a review process didn't catch it. Or the tools have been updated with new data around the vulnerabilities, and now you need to rescan and fix it if you find it. When we look at something like software composition analysis, this is moving down the, the, the stack. So after we've, we've written the code, this is the dependencies. So this is the opportunity for you to go through and actually start scanning the dependencies of your applications. Um, do we have any node developers in here? Yeah, how many of you have written like a four line node application and then ran npm build and now 4,000 libraries later, 
um, you, you have this massive application. This is an opportunity for you to scan those 4,000. And I joke, it's more like 400. Um, <laughs> but you can scan those applications and those dependencies so that you know you're not including something that has a vulnerability downstream. And things like OWASP Dependency Tracker will let you scan those open source solutions and keep track of them. Or better yet, pull them down, like we said, into a local repository that you have automatic scanning and you've vet basically validated and vetted it. One point that I want to get across throughout this entire process is it's like eating an elephant. Like you're not going to eat it all at one chunk, but we want to find that there's these opportunities that as you grow and mature in these processes, you can introduce new things one step at a time and grow these over a period of time. And as you go through this, these tools that are on the screen here through SNCC and MEND and Encore um, can help you um, ease that adoption and ease that maturity um, as, as, you, as you grow. Moving one layer down from that, we've got static code, uh, static application security testing, or SAST. And secret scanning is an example of this, um, but the idea is this happens early on in the development process. This is what we would consider things like white box testing. So you have access to the code base, you know its dependencies, you're actually scanning against that code base for known vulnerabilities, known issues, so that you can catch them before you go into the build processes, before you go in the, the, the pipelines. And the reason this is important is, imagine you're running a sprint. Your sprints are time bound. You don't wanna get to the end of that sprint where you're trying to do a release to then find out you have more development work to do. Um, but these tools let you at least identify those things and act against them. So even if it is later in, in the, the, the development cycle for that, that, that process, you can at least know that, hey, do we need to do a quick hot fix? Do we need to write a patch really quickly, get it in there? Or can we a, a assess the risk of that particular vulnerability and make a decision as to whether or not we want to come back next sprint and address it? Is it a low risk? Is it something that we don't think is going to actually be uh, an issue? Can we, can we make adjustments against it? But the idea here is you have your code base. You should be going through regular interval, uh, at regular intervals and scanning that code base for these vulnerabilities because new vulnerabilities appear every day and our knowledge of those vulnerabilities adjusts and adapts every day. And we've got solutions like Sneak, SonarCube is probably one that most of you are, are familiar with, but also we've got Amazon Code Guru, um, which has a lot of value across multiple stages of your build, but it also lets you know, um, it'll scan your application at, at regular intervals or on pull requests for known vulnerabilities as well. Moving further from that, and down the pipeline, we have dynamic application security testing. So this happens after you've built your application. So this is something that's done that's considered um, black box testing. So you don't necessarily have access to the code base itself, but you do have access to the running application. And so think of uh, dynamic application testing as something that the actual attackers in the real world are gonna be using. They're gonna be trying to find the ports that you left open, the SQL attacks, the, the gaps in the running application that they can kind of weasel their, their way into. So this is them trying to get through your window or the back door essentially of the running application or your built house. And the idea here is that there's, there's tools like OWASP Zap that will go through and actually scan for these things. The challenge with this is it's very much focused on the stuff that's already made it into your code. So the gaps are already there. It's just trying to discover them. Like, you've already opened that port, so it's not that a new port is opened up, it's just that it's there and you may not have known about it. And so it, these tools are really defined, once you've got the running code, what have you left, left open, essentially? Um, and these are very helpful because most of the time we're staring at the code or we're staring at observability or monitoring solutions later on in the story, this is in that process of before it gets to production, we can try and find any, any additional vulnerabilities that, that might have made their way in before they can be exploited. Um, but once it's in production, there's the runtime application self-protection. And this is different from dynamic application uh, testing in the sense that this is the running application and an active threat. So this is an attacker trying to do something in real time, trying to add a sidecar to your, your, your container that's running or your deployment that's running, trying to run a binary or application on one of your systems. And there's, these are typically implemented through some kind of agent that is either monitoring the container, or monitoring the server, or monitoring the workload that's actually running in real time, and it's taking 
all of the data that's coming in, and it can either do this through machine learning and trying to figure out like what is the normal baseline, or it can be monitoring the network traffic and everything else that's going on in real time. And it's making a decision that what looks normal, what looks good, versus what is a potential threat. And the benefit of doing this and using something like Falco or Sysdig um, or even Aqua is that they can take action in real time. So if they start to see traffic coming in from a location that it shouldn't be coming in from, it can actually, in real time, block that traffic and take an action to protect the application. And so you now have multiple shades of security, from the code itself early on in the development process to once you're compiling that code into built artifacts to the built artifact in the running application and beyond. And so we treat this as an important part of the shades of, of the life cycle of your application. And when we look at the, the software development life cycle here, it's not a start and a finish. And I'm not gonna call out all the things because this is an eye chart like in all reality. <laughs> um, but the idea here is that security is a horizontal. Observability is a horizontal. It doesn't just happen once you've deployed the application. It happens consistently and continuously throughout the entire development cycle. So it's gonna start when you're planning your applications and you're gonna, going back to the DevSecOps conversation, you're gonna talk to the networking team and explain why you need specific ports. You're gonna get agreement to that, put that in your code or build it into your pipeline or the infrastructure as code. Then you're gonna talk about the integrations that you're gonna make between different services and make sure you have the IAM policies in place to, to, to allow access and controls or the secrets that you need um, stored in the proper process. And you're gonna continue this throughout the entire development life cycle. So from build, to test, to deploy, to operate, and you're gonna put things in place that can help at every phase of this. Um, whether it be the static code analysis or the black box testing or the runtime scanning. The idea is you wanna make sure that you're covering all of these. And what this leads to is just making sure that you're implementing proper tests and checks throughout the process. And so I'll use some of these as examples here. Um, when we look at AWS code commit or code build, as actions are performed in that part of the life cycle, you have the options to trigger off of those events. So whether it's a commit that can now trigger a scan or it's a build job that's been fired off and it's triggering this, the idea is that as you build your, your application and start to store the artifacts and store those binaries, you're taking the right action, triggering through automation rather than a manual person having to go in and like validate things by hand, you're automating this process throughout the entire thing. And it doesn't matter whether you're using these solutions or you're using complementary solutions or uh, alternative solutions. So it's GitHub will work with this, Jenkins will work with these processes. The importance is that you're actually doing this at every stage of it and you're taking the opportunity in context of the, the, the component and doing the right scanning and doing the right alerting. Now, one of the things that we talked about earlier that James mentioned was the software bill of materials. And this is a little bit of an abstract concept for some people. Um, it's somewhat new, but the idea here is as you're building these applications and you have these downstream dependencies, if a vulnerability comes up, say there's a new vulnerability with a Java version or a specific binary or library, and you have 400 applications that are all Java applications, how do you know which applications are vulnerable? you gotta scan. You gotta go through and scan every single one of those applications. Or you can use something like a software bill of materials where you actually define, and there's tools that are open source, there's things that you can use that will actually scan your application and all of its dependencies and create using a kind of a specification, a document that basically defines all of the components through that entire software supply chain that are a part of your application. Seems a little excessive, but it's incredibly useful and you can automate this process so it's not a manual person going through and like trying to find all these dependencies. They can automatically do this on your behalf, but it lets you know who you're pulling these from, what their component names are, what versions are there, um, you know, what data and dependency relationships are there. So if you look at like one of the file formats, it reads a lot like XML and it's nested. So you can see the dependencies, you, you can visualize this, you can actually scan against it. So the event that there's an actual attack or an actual risk, you can know very quickly without having to go through all of your applications and scan against them, which applications may be vulnerable. And so if it's a specific Java version, you know that these 27 out of these 400 applications have that particular version or use that particular library. 
and if you've done all of this properly, now you know exactly which, um, which binaries, which downstream dependencies you should be preloading into your artifact repositories because these are the things that are actually needed by your applications. And if you're building a new application, these are the opportunities for you to take those and load them in, do the proper scanning, and make sure that they're there. It is in a very powerful process, um, but it's a process. And so this is something that, again, goes back to the, 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 the conversations that you need to be having across these teams to convey that value. Like, why is it important to do this work? Well. It's important because you hate scanning 400 applications every time there's an issue. Like, do a little bit of this work up front and we can simplify that story. I, as a developer, don't wanna have to go through 400 applications trying to find which one might be vulnerable. I wanna be able to get to those very quickly, fix them, get it off my plate, and get back to doing fun stuff. And this starts to lead into to some of the observability. So as we start to build out um, our pipelines and build out these processes, there's a lot of components that come along for the ride, and we need to be observing every aspect of this. It's not that we just observe the running application, that's something you should absolutely be doing, but the pipeline itself is something that should be observed in its entirety. And there's a lot of components and a lot of tools. I know James had that, that slide up earlier that had all of the various components. The idea is each of those can provide data that you can observe against and, and react against. And we have something like uh, AWS Distro for Open Telemetry that helps standardize that. So instead of having different file formats and different um, structures that you then have to pull in manually consume and try and make sense of to load in some kind of data lake that you can then scan against. I mean, how many of you have managed an ELK stack manually? I know I have, and it's a pain in the butt to load all of the different um, log sources into that, that, that system and make sense of it. So uh, uh, ADOT, as we call it, it simplifies and standardizes that. And so you can pull in all the data from AWS services, you can pull in from third-party services, and you can start to feed those into um, CloudWatch, you can feed it into um, uh, Datadog, you can feed it into New Relic, and you can start to make sense of it all with a little bit more simplicity. Now, as we start to build this out, everything that's in here is an event. So every code repository commit, every, um, every build process, it's all events. And it's gonna lead to some kind of dashboard that you're gonna have to make. So every, every part of that process or every team that's involved in those processes is another persona that you have to kind of feed. So your developers are one persona, your security team is another persona, your ops teams are another persona. Each of them needs to have contextualized information that's available to them. Um, and all of these can be pulled together through something like Security Hub. So as these events are occurring and all of these, these partner solutions or these third-party solutions that you're trying to pull data from, they can feed up into a centralized dashboard or a single pane of glass that then can take action against it. So if there's a runtime vulnerability that's being exploited in one of your applications and Falco triggers on that, it can notify Security Hub through these processes in real time, alert the security team. Security team now can automate the alert to you as the, the developer so you can go in and figure out what's going on or the security team can go in and quarantine that. And this will actually feed into EventBridge so you can actually automate some of that response. So you can go in and hit um, the, 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 the system quarantine that particular container so that you can do, go through and do a scan against it. The idea is observability, and I love this graphic, is just pretend there's an actual dashboard on there. Unfortunately, we couldn't find a, a picture that we were allowed to use that had an observability dashboard. It makes it look cooler than it actually is. <laughs> um, but the idea is observability is key. You want to, if you have a dashboard that's green, nobody's gonna look at that dashboard if it's green all the time. Because who cares? It's just, it's just noise. So the idea is you want to provide contextualized information to the teams that need that information need to take action against it. And so we want to basically make sure that you can provide full stack observability, not just for your security, but the runtime of, or the running and execution of your applications. And one easy way to do this is using something like CloudWatch, um, which can be installed through an agent. Um, so you can install this agent on your systems or you can put it in your task definition if you're using ECS, you can put it in your deployment file um, for um, EKS. But the idea is you want to start pulling this data in and making sense of it. So like I mentioned, we've got ADOT, you've got X-Ray that can do um, tracing within your applications. And the idea is you want to take advantage of all this data to pull it together so you can make sense of it and take action against it. And so 
trying to wrap this up really quickly because I've got seven seconds before they're gonna kick me off stage. <laughs> We've learned about how you secure your applications from the pipeline through the build to the runtime uh, scenarios and, and beyond. And the idea is that you should be taking advantage of this wherever you can, start somewhere, grow it over time. You don't have to do it all at once, um, but the idea is you should be taking actions to do that. If you wanna learn more, there's a couple of resources here. These slides will be available outside of this um, shortly after and there will be a recorded session as well. And so with that said, I want to say thank you. Um.